Tonight has been organised by, by SCAN, by volunteers from SCAN, as part of SCAN's contribution to the Swindon Literature Festival. Um, and really, just the format for this evening, I'm delighted to find myself sitting next to um, Patrick Holden, and we'll have Patrick on um, to say some words in a minute. When Patrick's finished, before we go into questions and answers, we'll just have a quick five-minute comfort break, and then we'll actually call up a small panel of um, local people as well, and I'll introduce them when we come up. So when we do questions and answers, uh, not only will we have Patrick's national experience and, and knowledge, but we'll be able to draw and reflect from some local perspectives as well, which hopefully will make it quite, quite an interesting session. So that's the outline of the evening. Um, just remains for me to introduce Patrick. Um, he's long been one of the, the finest thinkers around the, the area of food and the environment. Um, he's an organic farmer himself in South Wales, I, I believe. Um, I printed out big and I still need to So as well as running his own productive, long established 250 acre mixed field farm, um, he's done a lot of work on, in the public domain as well. Many of us will probably know him for many years as the director of the Soil Association and more recently he's established the Sustainable Food Trust, is a member of the Government Food Security Working Group um, and is an advisor to the Prince of Wales's International Sustainability Unit. Um, a busy chap, and I know from previous experience, well worth listening to. So I'll give you Patrick Holden. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me um, to uh, Lower Shore Farm and speak to you um, this evening. Um, the last time, I think the last time I was involved with a meeting in Swindon, it was the, at the um, STEAM um, exhibition, uh, whatever it's called, museum, and it was Kevin McLeod's sharing this, uh, I don't even know what it, the conference was called, but anyway. One Planet Swindon it was. One Planet Swindon, that's it. And I was invited to speak about um, the food element of One Planet Swindon. And I remember that at the end of the conference, there was a lot of interest in, you know, taking something forward. But for whatever reason, it sort of didn't quite... Swindon Council were involved, and they were going to have a plan, and it was all going to do something very interesting. And anyway, so it hasn't yet happened, but no doubt it will. <laughs> and Kevin said, actually, well, I, 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 that was the first time I met him, I thought he was a really nice guy. Genuine. I mean, he's, you know, he comes across for a lot of time, but actually he's nice to meet him in the flesh as well. And um, he said, look, if anything happens, because of his interest in swimming, because he's got this building project, isn't he? He said, I, I personally would like to get involved with that. But so far it hasn't happened, but maybe it still could. And I think, in a way, that's one of the things that I'd like to explore with you tonight. Why it is that despite the fact that our food production systems are um, seriously unsustainable and fragile and have very little resilience against future shocks, which I think are coming towards us, uh, you know, at a very rapid rate. Um, so little is being done uh, to put into place the changes which will be needed uh, to create uh, resilient and sustainable and secure food systems, which we may come to uh, uh, need very much uh, sooner than most people, most of us think, I suspect even including me, if you see what I mean, and I've kind of been aware of this, these issues for some time. So I thought that the way I would get to that would be to tell my own story um, and also link, link into that the story of food since the Second World War and how what's happened in the sort of bigger sweep of things um, and also talk about the issues internationally because, as was just said, my new role is heading up an organisation which hardly even exists yet, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. But its first public event was um, a very, very soft launch, so soft in fact that nobody even realised it was our launch, um, uh, was at the Botanic Gardens in Washington um, last Tuesday evening. Um, uh, on the eve of a conference called The Future of Food, which was at Georgetown University, uh, and at which the Prince of Wales gave what I think is the finest speech he's ever given, and probably the most important speech he's ever given in his life. 
um, which you must uh, read and look at because it's on the Washington Post website. And the day after, and I'll come to this later, um, I went to the White House garden and I picked spinach for President Obama's dinner. <laughs> How I came to, to pick spinach for President Obama's supper is a, is a kind of, a, you know, that's, that's a, but I think it all is connected. Um, so I'll start with, with me. I mean, I, I am an urban, uh, I'm kind of an example of how the trend towards the urbanization of um, the world's population uh, might yet be reversed. Because I'm a Londoner who went out of the city and uh, back into food and farming. Uh, the story of that is that I grew up in South London. I'm the son of a doctor. And I had lots of interesting early influences. Uh, on farms because I went on holiday on a couple of farms and um, <coughs> my family used to go on holidays in the Hebrides and my mum took me into a, a cow shed in Epping when I was five and I saw a herd of, I think they were Guernseys, they might have been Jerseys, being milked with one of those old pipelines and I thought I'd like to do that and that was when I was five and then when I was, by the time I was 20 I was actually milking cows in Wales and the connection was that um, my dad was a visiting professor at um, Stanford University in California in 1970 and I went out and had a very interesting year in, uh, in California uh, at an interesting time in its history. Um, came back full of uh, conviction that um, the world was, there was a, we were on the brink of an ecological collapse and that the, the sensible thing to do was to get back to the land and set up a rural community to, build, to, to prepare for the coming you know, collapse of civilization. Uh, so that is exactly what we did. Um, I got a job on a farm in Hampshire, a commercial intensive dairy farm, worked on the farm for a year, and then I did a course in biodynamic agriculture in um, Sussex which is a sort of um, a version of organic farming, uh, but taking into account uh, other factors, including the, um, the observations that a man called Rudolf Steiner, who was an Austrian philosopher, who uh, gave a series of lectures to uh, some farmers in East Germany um, in 1924, uh, who were worried about the loss of vitality of their crops. Um, he basically said that you, if you wanted to address this, because they were starting to use fertilizers, it's the very early stages with the intensification of agriculture. And these people, these farmers were farming on big estates in the former East Germany, and they were noticing that their crops were losing vitality. So they asked Steiner, who didn't even come from a farming background, but he was a sort of master and a teacher, to give them some indications about what they should do about it. And he gave this series of lectures, which became the basis of biodynamic farming in which he basically said you need to farm organically but you need to go further than that. You need to take into account um, the movement of the planetary bodies against the background of the sun and the zodiac <coughs> and you need to um, apply preparations, what you might summarize as being homeopathic preparations to your uh, compost to give them extra vitality and you need to put all that together and then your crops will regain the lost vitality. And I didn't know anything about that, but I was looking for a course in organic farming. And this was in 1972, so I did the Emerson uh, course in biodynamic agriculture. And then, with a group of six other people, uh, we headed off to West Wales, which was Britain's equivalent of California with a lot more rain. <laughs> but land was cheap, and it was very sort of romantic. And we ended up on a farm of 135 acres, about 10 miles end of the coast, at 750 feet above sea level with quite challenging climate and soils and started farming. We bought a herd of 30 Ayrshire cows, we started milking them and we kind of did all the things that you need to do on a very run down farm. We did some drainage and we put in buildings and for the next 15 years I was essentially a full-time farmer. There was a year when I didn't miss a milking and I learned how to farm by practice and I've realised subsequently that um, Doing things physically uh, gives you an understanding which you couldn't really derive from uh, any amount of study. And it just strikes me that the people who are in charge of uh, making agricultural policy in governments uh, across the world uh, largely have absolutely no practical experience in agriculture. And the farm 
which I, on which I uh, learned how to farm, is still going. Uh, it's now about 250 acres, and we've got 73 Ayrshire cows, and my son, Sam, who's now 35, is back on the farm with his wife, and now turning all our milk into a single farm unpasteurized cheese. Um, and we have um, a plan to try to make our farm um, as sustainable as possible and as resilient as possible, and I'll come to that later because it seems to me that that's what has to happen to all our um, farms and food systems in pretty short order if we're going to uh, address the challenges which lie ahead. So I did all that stuff, and that, the, the 15 years of full-time farming started for actually practically, we, were, we ended up on the farm in 73, and that sort of fast forwards us to the late 80s. And by that time, I was involved in a voluntary capacity working for the Soil Association and trying to bring together all the farmers that were interested in farming in a more sustainable way, but there was no market for the food, and we were facing the Common Agricultural Policy, which was rewarding intensive farmers with guaranteed prices for their crops and subsidising them, whereas if, and if you try to farm more sustainably, your yields were lower, you got less money, and so you, you were having um, difficulty in surviving. So we were kind of early adopters of a more sustainable farming system. So we thought, well, why not actually um, take our story to the public? So if we write down the description for what we're trying to do, virtually on the back of an envelope, and we take this story to the consuming public and say, look, we're trying to do this. It's a better story. It's a better way of treating animals. It's uh, not exploiting the environment so much, and the food's better quality as well. Maybe uh, you could buy it. And that actually was the story of the development of the organic standards in the market. When I was in on the ground floor, I actually drafted uh, the dairy standards, the, one of the first drafts, which we then sort of worked up, and they became an influence subsequently on the UK organic standards and the EU regulation, and indeed other standards all over the world. So that was my sort of entry into farming from a an urban background with no immediate ancestors who had anything to do with agriculture. In parallel with that, and before I you know, came along at all, uh, the origins of the movement for sustainable agriculture uh, really go back to the beginning of the 20th century when a man called Albert Howard, a British scientist knighted for his services to uh, agricultural research, he was a specialist in plant diseases, was sent by the British government uh, out to India to teach the Indians how to farm. Um, and um, he had the humility, right at the height of the British Empire, to realise on his arrival in the Hunza Valley, which is now part of Pakistan, but that was then northwest India, that he had nothing to teach them. Because he observed that they were practising truly sustainable agriculture. They were self-sufficient, they returned waste to the soil, they composted, they rotated their crops, and he noticed that the crops that they were growing, although they were, um, um, there were lots of pests and diseases around, because they're always around, they didn't seem to suffer losses. And he made the connection, he, he concluded that the reason why the plants were not suffering from pests and disease attack was because of the vitality which was the direct result of the fertility and the, uh, the good state of the soil. Then he noticed that the animals that were eating these crops were also vigorous and healthy, didn't get diseases, didn't get parasites, and he made the connection. And then finally, the Hunza, self-sufficient, eating uh, a sort of what we might call a whole food diet with a certain amount of meat, some dairy products, <coughs> but much more unprocessed raw foods, mm -hmm very different from the Western diet, even then, they lived to 120, they were fear fighters, they were specimens of vigor and vitality. And he concluded that the health of soil, plant, animal, and man, man in those days, humanity, is one and indivisible whole. And he set out to study the agriculture of the peasant farmers, who he called his professors, because he understood they knew more than he did, he set up a couple of research institutes. He stayed in India for 35 years, and he published a book in 1940 called An Agricultural Testament, which was his homage to what he'd learned from Indian agriculture. That book was read by a woman called Lady Balfour, 
who was the founder of the Soil Association. She was already farming in Suffolk by that time uh, with her sister. She had been, uh, she did a degree in agriculture at Reading University before the First World War. She ended up in the First World War on a farm in Monmouth during the sort of war effort at that time when self-sufficiency and food security was an issue. And then she realized, having read Howard's book and been influenced by other pioneer thinkers, one of whom, of course, was Rudolf Steiner, who I mentioned already, who gave his agriculture lectures in 1924, that there was an enormous amount of public ignorance about the soil, plant, animal, man, food, health connection. And as a result, the great institutions of the government, which were directing research or informing the policy on health, were taking things in a completely wrong direction. She realized that the greatest enemy of positive change was public ignorance. So she, she set up the Soil Association with the objective of creating a body of informed public opinion about these vital links. And she said, my subject is um, food, which concerns everyone. It is health, which, is, which concerns everyone. And it is the soil, which concerns everyone. And the link between the soil, food, and health, which concerns everyone, whether they realize it or not. Of course, they didn't realize it, and that was her a wonderful uh, vision for the need for an organization to be a carrier of this message. The organization was formed, that's the Soil Association, in 1946, the year after the war. And during the war, food security had once again been a major issue. People were short of food, the <coughs> convoys were being um, sunk by the U-boats. Uh, there was dig for victory and grow your own. And that was the last time this country faced a food security crisis. So we dug for victory, we coped magnificently, and we relied on this fantastic latticework of small-scale localised food systems, growers, small dairies, abattoirs which served every town. All the key staple foods were produced and consumed locally, and then of course there was some longer distance transportation, milk was, trans uh, was transported, for instance, by my dairy farm in West Wales, one of, I think there were 3,000 dairy farms in Ceredigion, Cardiganshire, where I farm, when we started, even in 1973, and now there are, I think, it might be less than 150, or something like that, I mean it's just unbelievable the contraction that has taken place, and those farms used to supply milk, which went onto a pre-beach enclosures railway at the, the Creamery, and then the milk train left the railway and went via South Wales to London every morning, taking the milk from you know the principalities <coughs> to um, into the into the capitals. So we had, in during the war, an amazingly uh, resilient and sustainable food system, which worked pretty well. But then, in the post-war um, but so, so food was a political issue and the post-war government decided that we must never go hungry again during the war of course we had a lot of um, nitrates which were, were used to make fertilisers and after the war it was decided that the nitrate fertilisers would be um, available for agriculture and the government uh, created a, the 1947 Agricultural Act which basically provided for the first time guaranteed prices for cereals and milk and all the other key commodities and, for the first time, the means to increase yields through the, the fertilization of the nitrogen fertilizer. So what happened was that the early message of Lady Balfour and the founders of the movement, Soil Association, was swept away in the post-war uh, tide of intensification. And for the next, really, 60 years, which is bringing us really almost up to date, that uh, chapter of agricultural history has prevailed. And if you look at what's happened, I don't know how many of you have seen the film <coughs> Food, Inc., which is an American film, uh, which shows how um, fewer and fewer producers, processors, distributors, um, and retailers are controlling more and more of the food we eat. So agriculture has been progressively industrialized, more and more fertilizers have been used. And if you use fertilizers to fertilize, let's say, a crop of wheat or just about any arable crop, you produce this very lush, watery growth. And you might have double the yield in a crop of winter wheat that you would grow if you were farming it um, organically. But as a result of that, the plants 
are sick because they are uh, taking up all these nutrients and the cell walls get thinner and the, um, the result of that is they become prone to fungal diseases or pest attack. And Howard said, we should come to regard pest diseases and parasites as nature's professors of good husbandry because they will reveal our management deficiencies. So if you force feed a plant or an animal with high protein feeds in the case of an animal or high nitrate fertilizer in the case of a crop, you create a state of um, very rapid growth but uh, vulnerability to pest and disease attacks. So nature's professors move in, the fungal diseases, the pests, etc. And then uh, the farmer is forced to use uh, fungicides, pesticides, and herbicides, because also nitrogen fertilizer stimulates the growth of weeds, to suppress the consequences of imbalanced nutrition. The same has happened in livestock units. We have the means of uh, increased um, production, which basically are the arable crops from all over the world, more recently a lot from the North American continent, GM soy and maize in particular, more than a million tons a year of which are now fed to our livestock. And when you feed livestock, especially ruminants with uh, cereals, you get um, very rapid growth, but actually very unhealthy conditions in the stomach of the animal. It encourages E. coli 0157 and other uh, pathogens which can affect the, uh, the stock. And then they discovered that if they uh, fed antibiotics in the diet to pigs and poultry in particular as has happened in this country, you will suppress the disease organisms uh, and that became endemic and then they, would, they were banned to be fed to uh, pigs and poultry but they're still used uh, under veterinary prescription so if you eat intensively produced uh, pork and um, poultry products it's very likely that they would have had a um, a veterinary, on veterinary recommendation, uh, a low level, level of antimicrobials or antibiotics in the diet to suppress diseases. So that's the sort of food system that, that the post-war agricultural policy, arguably with the best intentions of the government, because the government only wanted to just address the food security challenge, but the whole thing has come full circle, and now as a result, we've got very more, fewer and fewer farmers <coughs> producing commodity crops using unhealthy methods of production and those crops are being processed and distributed by multinational food companies and we are going down to our supermarket and buying food given the illusion of choice uh, when in fact many, many of the brands come from amazingly few um, core commodity crops which have all been intensively grown. And that, I mean, that's a bleak picture to paint because obviously there, are, there, is, uh, there has been a remarkable renaissance of uh, sustainable agriculture, organic farming and local food over the last 10-15 years. And if you look at the total market sales value of all that sustainable agriculture, community supported agriculture, local food, organic market, it probably comes to at the very most 5% of total um, total sales uh, or the total food market and the vast majority, 95% uh, comes from the other sort of farming system and this relentless process of centralisation and commoditization and industrialization of our farming systems is actually still going on. I mean we've heard about the Nocton Dairy um, proposal for, in, for this very large um, dairy farm with 8,100 cows in Lincolnshire and then there's an equivalent pig farm being proposed in uh, the Northwest. Um, there are huge issues about how we can stop this sort of juggernaut of, you know, taking farming from how it should be and um, taking it to a position where more and more of our food is industrially produced, traded on global markets, and far from secure or resilient. So that's really painting a quite depressing picture of um, how our food systems have developed. I wanted to do something about that and I started working for the Soil Association in the late 80s and we built the uh, platform for the organic market and uh, that has been very successful and we've reached a, a, a point or a plateau about three years ago where we were, um, the market was worth over £2 million pounds and it all looked pretty rosy and then the recession came, uh, the media slightly fell out of love with the 
uh, organic food movements, certainly, and start and issues about elitism and charges of, you know, it's all very well for the rich started to be founded about. And meanwhile, another storm was brewing, which Professor John, Sir John Beddington, who's the government chief scientist, articulated very well when he talked about the perfect storm. And this is an, the agenda that is, is now increasingly uh, capturing the interest of the leaders of the farming community. And the argument goes something like this. We have a combination of four major threats to our, the world's food systems. And they are climate change, obviously, and in, uh, dealing, doing something about the emissions, which are uh, already out, going out of control and bringing them down to a level where we prevent uh, irreversible climate change. Resource depletion, particularly fossil fuels, <coughs> uh, the oil is running out. I just read a report by Jeremy Leggett last week, who is an expert on peak oil and fossil <coughs> fuel depletion, who said that now the world's major oil companies are predicting that by 2030, more than half of the energy in the world will come from renewable systems. And that's a, a euphemistic way of saying um, the oil is running out, all the fossil fuels are running out, and we're going to have to convert to renewable energy in a pretty short time scale. So that even the oil companies are now saying we're, we're going to have to undergo this enormous uh, transformation from our current umbilical dependence on fossil fuel to renewable energy in 18 years or 19 years, if, if that's right, and it may be sooner than that. And then there's population growth, where whatever it is, 6.5 billion, we're going to peak at 9 billion. How are we going to feed all those people? And again, there's a diminishing area of land available for agriculture, partly because of climate change, partly because of urbanization. And finally, we've got the threat that more and more of our food is traded on global markets, long-distance supply. If there were sudden interruptions caused by external shocks, such as climatic events, seen plenty of those recently, you know, um, fires in Russia, floods in Pakistan, earthquakes in Japan, or conflicts, could be war, maybe over energy, or just trade disputes. If a series of those external shocks suddenly affected our food systems, and you look at this country with its, whatever it is, 67 million people, is it? Whatever it is, 61 million people, highly centralized food systems, a structural uh, deficiency, so we cannot produce enough food to feed ourselves, and you imagine that the food distribution systems were paralyzed, how long would it take before we would feel the pinch? And the answer is very, probably less than a week, because our, all our food systems are based on this incredibly efficient, in some terms, centralized distribution. And if they were suddenly interrupted, it wouldn't take very long before uh, we would be in trouble. And the government's plan, led by Professor John Bennington, you mentioned the food security working group that I've been a member of. It's called the High Level Food Security International Stakeholders Working Group. And the, that was part of the government's foresight food security report, which was published about five or six months ago now. And Everybody agrees that those threats are confronting our food systems, but there are two very divergent strands of opinion about how we, how we uh, uh, react to them. And the first is further intensification, <coughs> genetic engineering, more global trade. Um, uh, in other words, the system as we have it, but just sort of tweaked and fine-tuned and made a little bit more responsible and environmentally <coughs> um, 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 acceptable. But the second uh, line of thinking, which didn't prevail in the Foresight Report, even though I agree with all Bennington's perfect storm um, challenges, is that in order to cope with this major food security challenge, we need a fundamental transformation of our food systems, akin to a war effort, like there was in the Second World War, where we, our aim should be to build as a much resilient into the, resilience into the production system as possible, which means that if there were sudden external shocks, uh, they would, the systems would keep on working. And all the people of this country have derived as great a percentage of their staple foods, so that's the cereals, the vegetables, 
the fresh meat, the dairy products, from farms with whom they have a direct relationship as close as possible to where people live. So in Swindon's <coughs> terms, that would mean a strategic plan for Swindon, making sure that the farms in this sort of perimeter, the, foot, the food footprint of Swindon, redirect their production and their processing to serve the town of Swindon. And where there are surpluses, they could go on to London or wherever they, wherever it would be appropriate. And this wouldn't mean, of course, that we stop all trade in food. Uh, there will be lots of trade in food and all the crops that we can never grow in this country, like tea, coffee, and bananas, and or stuff which we can't grow enough of, because as I said, if we're going to peak at 70 million people and we haven't got the land area to feed our, our, our entire population, we're always going to have to continue to trade on world markets. But in order to avoid a food security emergency, which could at worst on day 7 or day 14 or however long it was, provoke migration and panic and a collapse of civil society, which we've really seen echoes of recently, with food riots in developing countries, which we all think, well, that's not us, we're civilised and we're okay. We need to make sure that when the crunch, the food crunch comes, which I think will have some parallels with the credit crunch, we have good reason to think, well, we'll we won't move, we won't go, we won't panic, because we know that there are farms that are there for us, not too far away, who we have a committed relationship with, we buy their meat or their dairy products or whatever it is, or we grow our own in Swindon in our gardens, or we have a relationship with the Community Supported Agriculture Programme where we're buying the produce, and we know that they will continue to work for us. And even though we may go a little bit hungry, and we may not be able to get tea, coffee, and bananas, we'll be okay, so we'll stay safe, stay where we are. That is, food, that is resilience, and that's food security on a local level. And if the world is going to avoid a global food crisis, which is exactly what Professor Bennington and others are predicting now, uh, if something isn't done. That, like, that is like a cellular level of what's got to happen in every country in the world, in every region of the world. Um, the, the combination of all the resilient cells will, will maintain stability in the face of this growing fragility of our food systems. Now that, that should be the plan. But is anyone thinking about this? Is anyone discussing this publicly? Uh, do David and Samantha Cameron get home at night and think, we need a food plan for this country? No. Uh, do the Obamas, on whose lawn I was last week, think about this? This is interesting. They actually probably do, because they saw, a pri they saw in the White House, they had, I know that they had a private showing the, food, the film Food Inc. But are they acting? Absolutely not. And the reason they're not acting is because food and food security and food systems resilience is not a political issue. It didn't feature at all in the last election. Nobody was talking about food and, and sustainable food systems because largely there's complete public ignorance about the fragility of our food systems, the urgency of the need to change, and the need for a war effort transition program along the lines of a sort of, you know, Rob Hopkins transition town effort applied at local level. And because there's no public awareness, which is, you know, what Lady you said was needed, more awareness of the fragility of our food systems and the way in which the industrialization of agriculture has compromised public health and wrecked the environment and destroyed biodiversity and all the other things it's done, because that hasn't really sunk home with people, there's no political pressure on the Obamas or the Camerons or anybody else, so nothing happens. Because it seems to me that a precondition for change is public awareness, which then translates into public pressure, which then results in action. So Swindon Council have done absolutely nothing, even when Kevin MacLeod said, you know, I'd like to support this. It's because nobody's <laughs> saying it's a voting issue. So why would they? And I think this is a very, this is something I've realised over many years of working within the sustainable food movement, trying to, you know, lobby ministers, ingratiate myself in the succession of ministers of agriculture, of all political persuasions, and got really not very far, it's because we didn't mobilise public opinion to the extent that was necessary in order to build the pressure, to politicise the thing, to enable the changes that are needed. 
And I've learned that. It's come, you know, it's taken me a long time. I'm a slow learner. It's taken me about 20 years to realise that. That if you want change, you have to have a precondition is informed public opinion. And what has actually happened in this country, we've had this incredible phenomenon which is called the environmental movement. And this came out of the work of Rachel Carson, who wrote her book Silent Spring in 1962. And she basically said, you know, pesticides are poisoning wildlife and birds. And the reaction to that was the modern conservation movement, which numbers millions of members uh, all over the UK. In fact, I think we've got probably one of the most numerically strong conservation movements in the world. But it's, it has its parallel in America as well. And what the conservation and environmental movement has been about post-war, instead of joining forces with the sustainable agriculture movement, organizations like the Soil Association, they have decided that the best way to protect wildlife is to create reserves which are separate from agriculture because there's been a tacit acceptance that the, the farming systems which used all these um, non-renewable inputs and pesticides were kind of inevitable and unstoppable. So the best way to mitigate the damage which has been caused to wildlife and birds and all the other um, uh, impact was to create a sort of you know, nature parks and food factory separation. And I think that that now has to change. And I think that quite a few of the conservation organizations are beginning to realize that their whole policy, RSPB, let's pick one organization, RSPB, I knew, I've had lots of discussions with RSPB over the years I've been involved with the Soil Association. Mostly they've said to us, look, you're very nice people, uh, who are advocates of sustainable agriculture, but it's never going to become mainstream. So what we have to do in the RSPB and in our, our other sister organizations is create policies to mitigate the damage. So all the stewardship schemes, the beetle banks and the bogs and the, all the rest of it, and I know that's because I'm a farmer, we have our own Welsh equivalent of this, which is called Tiagobal, which is the Welsh stewardship. It's called care for the land. But in fact, what it is, is it pays you to not do things, you know, and so actually from the farmer's point of view it's really difficult because you are, you know, we've got lots of fields on our farm which are, you're not allowed to put lime on and you're not allowed to cut them on the 15th of July because it's all about trying to encourage, uh, you know, habitat for species which would otherwise disappear. But in fact, if you want to slow down the decline of biodiversity, the best way is to change the way you farm. So until recently when I uh, uh, we eventually started taking money for this tier gobble scheme because it was of irresistibly large amounts so we couldn't really not take it we, we, we farmed organically since 1973 and we didn't take any money for any of these schemes but the result was we have an incredible bird population on our farm and loads of wildlife not because we've done anything specific but just we, because we farmed in a way which is essentially compatible with nature and so what we really have to do is there needs to be a coming together of the nature conservation and the new emerging food movement to recognize that if you want to um, protect and preserve and enhance nature, you have to change the way you farm. Now, all that needs to be part of an emerging strand of public opinion owned by the young, particularly the young, and it needs to constitute a new food movement which replaces the conservation movement this is, that has characterized the sort of uh, NGO <coughs> charitable movement uh, of this country for the last 40, 50 years. Whether that will come, I don't know, but what is interesting is that <coughs> it's already starting to happen in America. Um, I was in Washington last week, as I said, for this conference, which was called The Future of Food, and it was held at Georgetown University, which is a you know, major university, but I think something like 6,000, maybe, no, I think it's 11,000 students in, in the heart of Washington. And Eric Schlosser was one of the speakers. He wrote a book called Fast Food Nation, and he was also in the film Food Inc. And he and another guy called Michael Pollan, who's a very well-known um, food writer, uh, who was also in the film Food Inc., they have been getting amazing demand from universities, campuses all over America to speak on this subject of food and food ink and food security and you know changes in our food systems. And they are filling halls. And it's it's as if something has happened just in the last two or three years on the campuses across America and food is now cool, it's now trendy, and university students are very, very interested in food. I think that's going to happen in this country as well. So I think there's 
reason to believe that we're on the cusp of a very, very major change of consciousness. And it's almost as if a lot of the stuff, you know, the transition movement, and the ideas about food security and resilience and the need to bring nature and food production together, it's almost as if they are already known amongst young people. And all that's needed is for them to be articulated by some people who have these ideas and can get them across to them. And that can bring about the change that's necessary. So I'm, I'm feeling incredibly optimistic that I think we're on the, on the threshold of a very big change. And one of the reasons, having stepped down as director of the Soil Association last September, that I decided to uh, establish and head up a new organisation which is called the Sustainable Food Trust, which was launched last Tuesday evening, is because what I've noticed is that all over the world there are organisations doing excellent work in the sustainable food and farming arena, but we haven't been talking to each other. And as a result, we haven't broken through. Because if the total value of the sustainable food market, local, organic, and everything else, is only 5% of the total market, what are we going to do to address John Bennington's challenge of the perfect storm, enable the, the transformation of all our food systems in the very short period of time available? Well, I think the answer is we have to communicate more and work together to get our ideas across. So the idea of the Sustainable Food Trust is to establish a global coalition of all the organisations and individuals who are interested in food, the connection with food and health, the connection with food and environmental health, and who want to bring about collectively the political pressure to transform our food systems for the future, to work together to become more than the sum of our parts. We don't need to replicate a lot of the good work that's going on. That's not the point. The point is more to create a platform for sharing information and collaboration. And the sustain the future of food conference in uh, Washington DC brought together all the leaders of the US food movement for this one day conference and the evening before and there was the most fantastic atmosphere created and what was the highlight of the whole thing was the prince's speech and I would like to say a little bit about that because the prince is like a prophet in his own land he's been on this for 25 years and you can watch it because it's on the Washington Post Live uh, web website you want to see the speech he worked hard for about two months, I know this, to prepare this speech. He had some resistance from people who were worried it was too political and too, you know, radical, actually. And he persisted. <laughs> and he gave the speech of his life. It was quite incredible. And a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, there was everything in that speech, all the issues I've been touching on and more. And he put it all together. And he spoke from himself. It was coming out of the core of him because he really believed it. And he said right at the top, he said, the reason I've come here, it, uh, it's considerable risk to, you know, myself in constitutional terms, uh, you know, having just come back, come from the wedding and made, you know, embarrassing remarks about my son and him and me and all the rest of it. You've got to laugh for that. It's because I think that I owe it, knowing what I know, to future generations to do everything I can to address the potential crisis, world crisis, which is coming, and alert people to the severity of this, and to do what I can in the time available to try to, to uh, bring about a change. And he then proceeded to set out a sort of vision of what food systems ought to be. And the highlight, or one of the highlights of the speech for me, was, to, was when he pointed out that the problem we've got at the moment, and one of the reasons, as well as poor communication, why we haven't broken through, is because at the moment, if you are a citizen, either a farmer or a consumer, and you want to do, quote, the right thing, i.e. farm sustainably if you're a farmer, or buy sustainably produced food if you're a consumer, you make less money if you're a farmer, and you have to pay more if you're a consumer. And economists call that perverse incentives. In other words, why is it that we need to live in this crazy world where doing the right thing is less profitable and less affordable than than doing the wrong thing. So if you buy intensively produced food, even though it's screwing up the planet, it costs, it costs less. And if you farm sensibly and sustainably in a resilient way, you make less money. So leading up to the conference, the Prince has set up this unit called the International Sustainability Unit, and they tried to get a handle on why that was. And the reason is because a lot of the subsidies at the moment that go into agriculture are rewarding intensive practices, and the taxes, which there should be on, for instance, if a farmer puts pesticides into the water, they spray pesticides in the crop, they get into the soil, they go into the water, and then the water authorities have to strip the pesticides out, that costs our water bills. But 
Instead of paying at source, you pay in your water bill. So you get the illusion of cheapness in the food, when in fact you're paying elsewhere for the damage that's caused in your water bill. It's exactly the same with the health service. I mean, there's a, a crisis of obesity and diabetes amongst a whole generation of young people in America. And Eric Schlosser and others have shown that there are thousands of deaths a year now which are directly attributed either to intensive agriculture or uh, to downstream processing, which is compromising the vitality of the food, as the Hunza found out, that Howard observed. And if we could only see that a lot of the money that we're spending on the health service could be saved if we put our food systems in order, then actually, and, and we could see that we'd save money, or governments could see more to the point, they'd save money in the health service if, if they supported sustainable agriculture, then we wouldn't even be paying more in net terms. But the problem with that is that it's politically very <coughs> unattractive for a government to say, well, actually, you have to pay more for the right kind of food, or to tax uh, farming practices which cause these damaging consequences because it's politically unattractive and there's probably more, more than a five-year time split scale in, in, in reaching good results. So we're frozen into this system. We're doing the wrong thing pays more. We're buying the wrong food is cheaper, and right action isn't yet affordable. How we deal with that is, I think, the big challenge. And one of the things that you know, has been discussed just in the few days since the conference in Washington is getting uh, all the foundations in America who fund sustainable agriculture together to commission a much larger study to show how if governments did the, did the right sort of things, and, you know, the prince had a meeting with President Obama, of course, as you do when you're in Washington, whereas I merely pick the president's <laughs> <laughs> that Obama is listening to these things. And I think we need to get the message across to Cameron as well, and whoever succeeds the, the, the present government. And if we could do these things, we could create the conditions where the radical transformation of our food systems could come about. And what could you do? I think that, you know, in a way, that's the key point, because we are individually cells of this global food systems, and we, and we need to feel that our actions count not just in terms of improving our own health, but in microcosm, the systems that we adopt in our households, on our allotment, whatever system we're in, or in my case, on my farming ways, uh, they are part of the solution. But we also need to feel when we're going about our you know, transformed action, that, we're, that our action really is connected to the higher principles and the higher whole and the sort of philosophies that you know, policies that Obama or Cameron or whoever else would have to bring in to transform our food systems. And in my case, I'll just tell you a little bit about my transition journey, because I met Rob Hopkins in 2006, and he very much inspired me, and he made me realise that actually, whereas I felt really depressed about climate change, I thought, this food thing I could do something about, because it starts with me, and I don't have to wait for the politicians to act. So what we're trying to do on our farm is we're, we're trying to make it as resilient as possible to external shocks. And the things we've done so far is we've got an energy plan, rather embryonic, but it, the, the aim will be to to generate all the energy that we need for, to run our farm, which is a lot, because uh, we're milking dairy cows, we're heating water, we're pumping water over place, etc., etc., <coughs> from the farm. So we're looking at a mix of energy, photovoltaic, we've got a ground source heat pump, which we've really put in to heat the farmhouse. We want to do a methane thing on our slurry tanks, we've got dairy cows, uh, we're looking at a wind turbine as well, I don't know what you think about wind turbines, but they're lovely, and we're going to put one on our hill, because you know, we're on a windy site. That's our energy plan, and we're trying to make ourselves self-sufficient in bedding, because at the moment, historically, if you ever go into Wales in the winter, you see straw lorries coming from England, so all the bedding for all the cattle has come from the, the cereal fields of England, so we are trying to make ourselves self-sufficient in bedding by cutting rush hay and using that to bed our dairy cattle. We're looking at how we can grow our own protein feed, because we used to, well, we still do buy an element of concentrated <coughs> livestock feed for our dairy cows. We're feeding them sort of moosely now, and we're growing the oats ourselves, and we're trying to grow it on local farms. And we also would like to look at seed saving, so we're not reliant on some you know, seed distributor from a long way away. So that's our kind of transition plan for our farm. And obviously, in an ideal world, we would like to sell all our cheese on local markets all at the moment because, as I was just explaining, it's more expensive. We're sending it to Niels Yard Dairy and it's about to start to go to Germany because there's a German organic supermarket chain that wants to stock it. So that's the crazy world we live in where doing the right things isn't yet possible. So the early adopters have to sort of compromise 
in order to you know, survive until things come right. But I think if you apply that to your own household, you need to grow as much of your own food as possible. You need to make a commitment not to buy all your food from local and sustainable sources, but to just decide that you will make a relationship with a local producer in some form or another and say, OK, I will make sure that 20% of my food budget is from local, my staples, not, not the luxury, is from local production. And if everybody did that, I think the per capita food budget is something like £2,000. So that's a lot of money. And if enough citizens did that, that is the change, because then that provides uh, an economic flow of resources for uh, the local producer. That enables them to carry on in business. So, and then of course you can have an energy plan for your house as well. Some of you are already doing that. But I, I, I just think the, the point that I'm trying to make really is that you are the person who will change. We, as individual citizens, we are like cells in all this. And we are connected to everything. And if we make our own plan and implement it, we are already at, at the grassroots level a part of the bigger solution. What we want to do with the Sustainable Food Trust is basically create a platform for information exchange. So we're going to be launching a website pretty soon. And the idea was, is that it will be a platform for information exchange and also a chance for, we're not going to have a membership, but we'll have a supporter base. And we want people to feel that they are part of this big global food movement, which is actually sharing identical challenges all over the world and which, if we work together, can enable this transformation. So I've got to shut up. <laughs> Sorry about them going on so long. But as you can tell, I'm quite animated by this. And I do think we are at a moment where transformational change is possible, where if we work together and we put aside all differences and we stop, even, our, even the sustainable food movement, we sort of get to ourselves. ourselves. We've been so moral and so superior and so right about everything. And in fact, we're all in, in, in this together now. And our attitude towards the people who we're fighting against has to change. We have to be much more inclusive. We have to bring people in. And we have to say we are facing a common challenge, which is akin to a, you know, a war, war emergency. And faced with that, it's all hands to the public.